So hello and welcome to the Refreshing Views Observatory. We've just got back from visiting another observatory. We've just been to see Barry Fitzgerald. Now we've met Barry in an earlier video when we explored the comet impact crater chain on the moon. So in this video, Barry is going to show us his setup, his observatory, his telescope, sorry, his telescopes and all the equipment and accessories he's got to go with it. Please be aware though that while we were filming the heavens opened, it absolutely poured with rain. So you will hear that background noise on the roof. So Barry, thank you so much for turning me around. I'm just seeing your certificate over there. You're an award-winning ah, astronomer. Well, yeah, well, that's a big. That was a big surprise to me. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't think I'd done anything special, but but it's very nice to get it anyway. So very very pleased with that. So what have we got set up in here then? Right, this is a. Uh, so basically, I'm not a uh, a photographer. I just do visual. So the observatory set up for visual um, uh, observing or I um, live view the moon. So one of my interests is, is uh, the moon, lunar geology, that type of thing. Uh, uh, TLPs, transit lunar phenomena. Um, but I'm not really a great imager, so I, I just live view it. If I see the, something on the moon surface that I want to record and then sort of study later, yeah. I'll just take a snapshot or something like that. So not big into imaging, but I do use it with a planetary camera. So what we've got here, I've got, I use a couple of different telescopes for looking at the moon. I use this one, the Tech 140, which is quite a nice um, refractor. It's nice and light. Uh, it's always in collimation. You don't have to worry about, you know, do I need to tweak it or anything else like that. Um, so you like your good optics then with the Tech? And it's, it's optically, it's very good. Yeah, I've had it for about five years and it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to use. So I'll use it with a planetary camera, so a um, ZWO120, um, or I'll use use it with binary viewers. And on this mount, the AZ EQ6 GT, um, I always have it in Altaz mode. So if I'm looking at the moon visually or anything else, the eyepiece is always in the same yeah. place. You don't have to sort of adjust it or, or whatever. It's always at the back of the telescope. The eyepieces are always pointing upwards. Perfect. So that's, that's really good. So and it still tracks, doesn't it? In order, <coughs> doesn't it? So. Oh, it, it, it tracks, yeah. Um, 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 for, for visual or for, for sort of like the lunar stuff that I do, the tracking is fine. You know, you don't, don't get any drift. I, w I wouldn't know how accurately it is tracking because as I say, I don't do, um, don't do astrophotography and really if it's off by a little bit it really doesn't matter to me but for observing for observing it's perfectly okay and i use it i um i use the the app on my mobile phone to control it so i so the place isn't covered in twangy cables and that's that's really great to use that app so i either use that or if i want a bit more resolution i've got a, a 10 inch newtonian here um and i just swap them over and that one obviously you get slightly more resolution with the Newtonian, um, but there's always the, the 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 problem about you know sort of ensuring that your collimation is spot on. And I've recently started uh, star testing it using a planetary camera, which is a really easy way to do it. Um, so I do rough. This is your collimation, is it? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I either use things like where are they? You know the the old sight tubes or. Um, uh, an auto collimator to get it roughly and then stick it on the stick it on the mount polaris is that way because the uh, observatory is orientated north south so i can just about get polaris um, uh, and then once it's in the eyepiece change over to the planetary camera i have a little laptop and i can sit at the at the back end of the telescope look at the image and then twiddle twiddle the column uh, the um the primary mirror and get the collimation absolutely spot on and I've um, I've got uh, it's I think it's called Mirda Collimation one of those free programs that you download and it's a series of circles you can increase the number of circles that you've got on the screen and across here and you just put that over the star image and then tweak it until it's perfectly symmetrical and it's a it's a it's a it seems to be a very accurate way to do it and a very easy way to do it and you don't have to have arms that are six foot long to reach from the eyepiece <laughs> to the back of the back of the telescope to do it you can, you can do it from a seat position um, quite easily so you've got ventilation in there but is that a fan down there or is that the cooling no, fan for the newton i put that on the so when i set the newtonian up i i've got a fan on the mirror cell 
but I also put that uh, okay. on the front. So I have the fan pushing the air up the tube from uh, behind okay. the primary, and then that fan pulling it. Oh, just to get it cooled down that little bit to faster? To get it cooled down, yeah. And to, and to be honest with you, every time I've used it, after leaving that running for an hour, the... Um, there's sort of it, it, there's really not much in the way of tube current. It really works very yeah, very okay. well. Um, and Just then a USB fan. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And it got sort of like USB ports down on these little boxes here. Um, and obviously when I when I start using it, that fan comes off. But I leave the fan on the mirror cell oh, running, and it doesn't. I mean because I, I you sort of do do the star test with the fan running. And it really doesn't introduce any vibrations wow. at all, so I'm quite happy to let it run the whole time. Gotcha. Uh, and also, the, it's got the added benefit that because it's blown air up the tube, um, it keeps the secondary mirror clear of dew. Um. I mean, I've got a big, um, you know, a, 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 a dew cap here, and I've got a heater on the secondary mirror. But it never really needs it okay. because you can actually stand at the front of the tube, and you could feel the draft right. coming up. So, so it's keeping it ambient and so not letting it yeah, drop. Exactly, yeah. yes. And the other night, I mean, I'd, I was out till four and it was completely frosted over, but the secondary was completely clear. There was never any problem at all. So that was quite, quite a, a, a good added bonus of having a, a fan on the primary. Gotcha. Yeah. You just um, thought, oh, okay. Uh, and that's your motorised focus, just with the, the V-belt, the uh, timing belt. Yeah, timing belt from a 3D printer, and it, it works fine, so um, rather than... And, of course, I don't want to... I didn't want to start putting on any sophisticated autofocuses, because I don't need it, basically. Yeah, yeah. I just need to be able to focus it. So you're it, just looking through the eyepiece or looking through the camera? Exactly. Uh, and, and if I'm just doing visual, I'll just take that off and just use... To use, use the focuser as it is, and if it was attached in the Skywatcher approved manner, i.e., you take the knob oh, off, etc., yeah. etc., et et then it'd be there permanently, and you have to sort of operate it through the hand controller. Oh, what's your? Because you got the little Wi-Fi one. Where's that then? I had got one of these Wi-Fi ones. Yeah. So this attaches to the um, focuser, and you operate it using a little hand controller so it does away with so here's the here's the twangy cable that goes to the um, autofocuser so you've got that so at night I've got that draped across going to the, um, the the motor which you know it's not a big problem really but if you want to dispense with that problem uh, you can use this so that attaches to the the, um, the motor and you operate it remotely with a hand controller, but I mean to say it's slow is an understatement. <laughs> it, you'd be sitting there for twenty minutes trying to get it to focus. That's so, Fortronics or what's that? Fortronics, yeah. yeah. So I have used it, but I've reverted to having the twangy cable mm. because it is quite slow. Um, so maybe I should give it another go yeah. uh, to dispense with the cable. Motorized focus is invaluable, isn't it? I'm it, it, it it is yes, um, because you're constantly, constantly focusing it. As you will know from your imaging, you're constantly focusing, and to have that the the motorized focus is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and of course you're not touching it. Uh, That's the real difference, isn't it? Because when the seeing's bad and you're trying to judge fine focus. Yes, introducing the vibrations. Um, you, it's you know you're constantly doing it, and you know sort of. Uh, makes life so much easier so, yeah so that that works well and um i say sometimes it's a bit bit of a bit of a heath robinson affair but i've got one of those attached to the reflector as well again not in yeah. the um approved sky watcher manner <coughs> but in a in quite a heath robinson manner um On the bottom there again attached to the fine focus knob with a cam belt oh, but it works it serves the purpose and if i want to take this out somewhere um and use it on the sky t mount or something i just take that off and it's back to yep. just a normal focuser gotcha rather than having to um take this off and attach that and etc etc
so, so that's that. And as I said, I've got a pair of large binoculars. And when I when I'm in a, a bit of a deep sky binocular mood, I'll take this one off and stick the binoculars on oh, wow. and use the same mount, which is great. So I can use several different telescopes on the same mount, depending on what I want to look at, what the phase of the moon is, that type of thing. So it's quite quite versatile. So what's the, so you've got the AZEQ6, what's it mounted on? What, this thing? Yeah, what's the pier? That is a, that's an, that's an Altair Astro pier. Um, I think it's one of those ones that, um, uh, are made specifically for Skywatcher mounts, um, and it's uh, so it's it's attached to so underneath the floor, there's um, so before the shed went in, um, dug a hole a meter deep, filled it up with concrete, and this thing's bolted to that great big slab of concrete, so it's absolutely um, rock solid, uh, and the um, the the pier just um, is matched to the the fittings of the. I think various AZ mounts are there, AZ, um, the, the, the uh, Skywatch mounts rather. So in this case, the AZ. But I think it's compatible with any of the Skywatch mounts and, and probably a lot of other ones. But that's that's a so I bought that off the shelf. It's not made or anything else like that. Uh, and just that one's just an extension um, for the EQ6 just to raise it up just slightly. A bit yeah, because otherwise without it, the eyepiece would be pretty low down. Um, so yeah. So how is it? How did you? But your observatory is far too tidy, I must admit. But how did you build the shed? How did you uh, build the well? Top? It was. I went to a. Um, it was always a toss-up whether we we're going, going to get a dome or a runoff shed, and I went for this a runoff shed eventually because once the roof is off, you can see the entire sky, which is quite nice. Um, there's a have a little camp chair, sit in the corner when you're not image, or not um, visually observing or whatever, and just sit there with a cup of coffee and look at the sky, which is great because you can see a huge wave of the sky uh, once the roof is open. Um, so essentially, I went to a it's a firm that did custom timber buildings. So I went to them and said, I want a shed, but I want it with the roof that rolls off. And after a few conversations um, with the guy who ran it, came up with a with a plan. Uh, and he built it to that. I mean, there was a little bit of to and fro about how it would be, um, but eventually it was fabricated, I believe, in Finland, shipped over here, and they they put it together. Oh, and by and large, it's been very very good. If I was doing it again, I would have it um, a few changes um, to it, but um, bearing in mind that they'd never done anything like this before, I think they did quite a good job. I mean, obviously, you can see with the roof, um, it hasn't got any cross bracing at all um, because of the way it's constructed. That's that's a fault as far as I'm concerned, because if you've got a heavy snowfall or something like that, the roof might not be strong enough to support it. We have had heavy snowfalls and it's it survived OK, but I think I'd prefer some cross bracing. Uh, if I did it again, stop it splaying outwards. Exactly, stop it splaying out. But there's never been a problem, and it runs backwards and forwards. Um, it's it's um, it's not rollers or anything else like that. It's little brass wheels from sash cord windows. So the runners on the outside have got these um, runners, these these wheels um, embedded in the in in a longitudinal member, and they run on just a bit of angle iron uh, okay. and. By and large, it's usually quite smooth. It's easy to open. Um, it's never seized up. Um, Did it survive when we have the cold weather? It, yeah, it all works fine in the cold weather. Cold weather is fine. It's, and a, it's li all, a living thing, isn't it? It is a living thing. And as far as um, uh, the microclimate in here is concerned, it's I've never had a damp problem at all. Nothing's ever been damp. I've got, got a dehumidifier in the corner and a greenhouse heater, which I run very rarely. Um, but after a night's observing, the whole place can be dripping with dew, shut the roof up, close the flap, put the dehumidifier on, come here in the, ne uh, in the next morning, and everything's bone dry. Wow. Uh, so, and the humidity, I keep it to around about 50, 60%. And I've never had, as I say, never had a damp problem with um, rust, anything uh, on the optics anything with the electronics it's all been fine so as far as um the microclimate in here is concerned it's it's really quite good and you no got the rubber matting on the floor matting, yes so it's got obviously a 
a, a wooden floor. Um, and that's separate, separated from the pier? Yeah, it's separated from the pier, so there's a big hole where the pier is. Oh, I came in, I hadn't been in here for a, a couple of months, I came in here, and it was mice. And apparently they were coming up through the gap between the pier and the floor. So I had the devil's own job of trying to deter them coming in. I put mouse traps down because I thought, even though, you know, I was quite happy to live and let live with the spiders, with the mice, and there was some nibbling on one or two cables. I thought, that's it, it's me or the mice. Yeah. Um, so I put mouse traps down, not interested. Uh, so they didn't touch it at all. So I had to eventually um, block up the gap with, with wire wool, and that seems to have deterred them uh, completely. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a nice warm place for them in the winter, it, it, isn't it? So well, it, is, it, it seems to be the f and and of course, what you don't want to do is after you sat there in the evening drinking your hot cocoa and tromping down your digestive biscuits, you don't want to leave crumbs behind because yeah. <laughs> that'll attract them as well. So I have a strict no biscuit rule <laughs> in, in the observatory now. So that's it. So no more. So that was the only problem I've had with with vermin. Um, the mice and the wire wall around the edge seemed to have deterred them completely. So people so. living, you know, who are watching this in Canada or North America and they've got bears and coyotes, you know, in England we've just got to worry about mice. Mice, there's hedgehogs as well obviously, <laughs> Killer but hedgehogs. they're not too much of a problem. Prickly yeah. customer. Yeah, prickly customers, yeah. No, no, we don't don't uh, have, uh, I mean there are toads, um, toads live underneath, but I don't mind that, that's fine. Well, eat the slugs. Eat the slugs indeed. But yeah, no, it's it's been, um, as as far as a, an a addition to my hobby to astronomy having this has been really um a big step up because it's so easy to come out from the house um i just open this is a flap that goes down just open this lower that and then the roof slides back and you're ready to go in literally five minutes and at the end of the evening once you've had enough you just park the telescope slide the roof back bring the flap back up, put the dehumidifier on, then you're done and you're away. And you can come out the next day and just tidy up afterwards, put the lens cap on, etc, etc, tidy the cables away. So it's been a, a real boon having this. So, and if you can, This is your grab and go setup, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. Grab yes. It's so, so, so easy. Because otherwise, I mean, putting this stuff on a tripod, I mean, I used to do that obviously beforehand, setting up a tripod with this mount, with the counterweights, and then bringing the telescope out and setting up on the lawn, it just deters you. Whereas with this, you you know, you can set your alarm clock for one o'clock in the morning, come down, and five minutes later, you're, you're, you're up and running. Which is Fantastic. Great. So well, how big is the observatory, Barry? How, how many feet by feet or meters by meters? Well, it's 11 by, I was gonna say 11 by eight. Uh, 11 by 8. So In this, total, this, or just this room? It, it, the whole thing 11 by 8. This observing bit is 8 by 8. 8 by 8. 8 by 8. So, which is just about, I wouldn't want to go really any smaller. If, if, you, if you're doing imaging and you're not going to be in there with your telescope, I think you could get away with being a little bit smaller. Um, but if you are going to be sat in here and moving around with your chair and viewing at the eyepiece, I think eight by eight is probably about the minimum to allow you to get around. Mm. Um, otherwise you're bumping into the walls. And that's, bear in mind, this is just an, uh, an F7, so it's not, it's not a big long telescope. So, so for, for the equipment I've got, this is just about the right space. Anything small would be a bit of a problem. Right? So that's eight by eight, and then the wall room's three by eight. Yeah, yeah, three three by eight. Yeah. So just enough to get get yourself in there and, yeah. and sat in there. And there is a door that if I wanted to slide across, so if I wanted to shut you out, I could slide the door across, and then this would be I say, but I never do. I normally sit with the door open. Oh, then you can see the kit then, can't you? Exactly, keep an eye on it, and sort of just put, poke your head in here, see what the clouds are doing, if anything. But I mean, also with this, I mean, if I'm, because I am to like spend an awful lot of my time looking at the moon, which is in that direction there, quite often I can half shut the roof, um, which, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know what it does to the thermal sort of behaviour of the, of the observatory, but at least it protects the, the computer and that sort of stuff, which are down this end of the, because you, you don't need quite so much of the sky exposed if you're looking at the moon. 
So, so what have you done for the mains power? Do you have mains power? <coughs> yeah, I've got mains power come. So uh, it's um, I read, you know, sort of accounts of people digging trenches and putting sort of cables in, uh, and that sounded quite quite onerous. Um, but when we had our conservatory done, I said to the electrician, "Can you run a cable to the shed?" He said, "No, I'll just put uh, an armoured cable. It'll just lie in the border, and apparently nothing can." Um, it's impervious to all sorts of vermin and um, mice and hedgehogs and toads uh, and it runs into the um, uh, observatory down there so it comes on the border a across the footpath on a pole and it comes in down there and I've just got a, um, two, two points there and then run cables underneath two extension cables there and on the wall there and that provides sufficient Sufficient power to sort of like work everything. So you've got the dehumidifier, the heater. Dehumidifier, the heater, the uh, couple of transformers for the mount, and the, all the dew bands, that type of stuff. Um, and uh, power pots there for the computer, the screen next door, keyboard, etc. etc. Because you're stood in the warm room and it's a bit dark, I mean, you oh, can't okay. really see it. But normally, if I'm, if I'm uh, viewing the moon, I have the planetary camera stuck in here. Moon's obviously going to be in that direction over there towards the south or, or towards the west. Um, and in the corner there I've got a, a small table, have a laptop there so the, the USB cable goes from the camera into the laptop um, and I get it lined up and focused and all that sort of in here using that laptop. And then there's a cable feeds through and there's a screen in the warm room yeah. and I just sit in there and on. Uh, and underneath the desk, there's a radiator. Uh, should, we, should we swap around and have a look? Then? Yeah, Let's yeah, see. sure. Yeah. Well, we could do the dance around the telescope. Yeah, I'll go this way. way. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> when the music stops, we'll find a. Yeah. And I'll have to come back and have a look at all your pictures and your your charts. If I can uh, get some light in here. Uh, so this is your chair, so as you can see this. So that's got a laptop in. Oh, I, I, it, oh, the laptop. That's where it would yeah, be. Yeah, that's where it would be if it wasn't. Um, oh, got a red light in here. It's not going to be very helpful, but at least you get that's right. We get can get an the idea what's in there. Yeah. So it's just a a, 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 a large screen, a keyboard, mouse. That's fantastic. Um, remotes. Uh, so I use a, a a cheap Skywatcher autofocuser. So I have the autofocus unit there, and just having a long extension cable. Um, to run to you, the got your, you got your clanger as well. Got a clanger, obviously that's mandatory and for anybody who's charts. interested in the moon. <laughs> um, yeah, and shelves on the other side just to keep the um, the boxes with the eyepieces and all that sort of. Just a little spare telescope there, a little um, 120 um, little acromat if I wanted to uh, go out. And so it's useful to keep all your cold weather clothing and all that sort of yeah, business. Keep all your stuff in there. there. Your yeah. observatory's so tight. I've got crap everywhere. How do you keep yourself so tidy? Well, I don't. I mean, it's it's. Uh, well, apart from the fact that I came out and tidied it yesterday, <laughs> it's not usually this tidy. Um, but I mean, it only takes five minutes to to come out and, and square it away. Um, okay, let's get some. I'm looking at all these hooks. You got all your accessories yeah. on hooks, and yeah. and it's it's one of those things. There's always something to do. You know, sort of. You come out here for five minutes, and you're out here for three quarters of an hour because you want to move something or yeah. do something else so it's it's a great time waster so this is your happy place yeah it's 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 um yeah it works really well as i say it's it's just so convenient and i wouldn't do a fraction of the astronomy that i do if i hadn't got this yeah. because it just makes it so easy so uh what else we got so some tripods so we've got a um one of these lovely build back tripods with a oh, uh, look at that with a um, Sky T mount on there and I've got so I can put large binoculars or sometimes I've got a, a similar similar size refractor that I, this is Sunday best I've got another one that I you could use to take out if I want to go out um, uh, with with the local astronomy club or something like that so I'll mount that on there um, one of these chairs which is excellent um, oh, your observing chair? Yeah, observing chair, which is absolutely superb. Um, very, very useful. Yeah, it's really very good. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's, it's very good. Um, 
I just put some foam on there just to make it a little bit more comfortable but it is a very very good chair um, I'd say it's quite stable um, but I have fallen off it um, but it is it is quite a stable chair um, and if you're going out and about you know, get a grab and go set up and go out it folds it up really, really small, doesn't is, it? is good yeah it folds up nicely and it's where just you, where did you get it from did you say I think it's probably first like optics or something you know, somebody like that um, and it's got a, you know sort of turns into got a carrying handle there so it's a very versatile bit of kit and I, I use it in here as well I, re, I either use that telescopic one yeah. or use that if, because that will only go down so far but if I um, if I'm using this and the eyepiece is quite low down then I'll use this one because the seating position will be adjusted so you are quite low down oh the way it falls down so small That's yes very it's, clever, it's, it? it's very very neat yeah very very neat so how do you handle security? Do you I've got an alarm and I've got all the all the fittings, all the doors and the window fittings are they're, they're not ordinary screws, they're these non-return screws. So um, so there's padlocks on the outside with non-return screws, which is a real pain if you put them in the first instance, put them on in the wrong place. <laughs> because then you have to take them off. And being non-return screws it uh, takes a long oh, really? time <laughs> so I sort of and their specialist locks on the outside as well yeah. so they haven't got exposed shanks that you can take a, a, a bolt property gotcha. or anything else you'd have to and of course being res reasonably close to the house it would make an awful lot of noise yeah. um, doing anything here so uh, so I think it's pretty uh, you know as far as as far as I can get it is about as secure as it can be Oh, fantastic, Barry. Can we have a look at your charts on the wall? What have we got over here? Then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are just... So, again, because because I'm uh, primarily interested in the moon, so I just got a couple of couple of moon charts. This one's one of the one of the lovely LAC ones produced by um, uh, uh, NASA. Um, so I got a whole load of these lunar LAC charts years and years ago, and some of them are very detailed. To be honest with you, I don't I don't use them for reference. They're just, <laughs> they're just because they look nice. Oh, they're fantastic! Um, because if I am if I am uh, observing the moon, for instance, and I see a, uh, a structure that I don't recognise, or I see it and I think that's unusual illumination. What is that feature I'm looking at? I'll use the lunar reconnaissance orbiter quick map because it's I've got Wi-Fi in here as well. Oh, you look it up online? Okay. Yeah, I'll, yeah. So I'll look it up online. Uh, uh, and so that's what you talked to us through, is it, all those months ago? Was it that quick map? That's it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and it's, um, so you've, you've got um, uh, highly detailed sort of like imagery of the, of the lunar surface. Oh, thank you so much for turning us around, Barry. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, so sorry about the looking. weather. Yeah, it's a shame we can't get the roof off. Yeah, but, uh, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. that would would have been good. It wouldn't, good. It just wouldn't do the instruments any good, would it? Yeah, no, it wouldn't wouldn't work that well. So two weeks of clear skies, and I've come on the wet, windy, horrible day. Yeah, well, that's 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 more to do with you. Then, <laughs> yeah, it? It just says something about you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, living under a cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you think of an observatory, it's well worth it. Oh, no brainer. Absolutely no brainer. Yeah, yes, yeah. And as I say, roll off a runoff shed ticks all the boxes for me. I'd love to have had a dome because the idea of having a dome and just the look of one is so very, very appealing. But when you do roll the roof back and you can put your little deck chair down there in the corner and just sit up and look at the sky and just take it all in with your cup of coffee. Uh, obviously not any biscuits because of the mice um, <laughs> it really is nice you've got the whole sky to look at which yeah. is possibly not so easy when you've just got a, a slit just that in slit, the isn't it? and of course yeah. if you're as the sky slowly rotates you've got to keep on rotating the dome so you've got to yes. enslave one to the other yes, either manually yeah. or automatically so it's not yes yes yeah. and certainly with a lot of this a lot of the alterations and modifications to it I can do it myself even with my exceedingly rudimentary DIY skills but with a with a fiberglass dome and a lot of automation mm. I think I would struggle so uh, but this is you know even a buffoon like me can fiddle about with this and do alterations to it yeah brilliant so so these are what the 80 mil binoculars yeah these are the 80 mil um ABM. then they're the non-APA ones um but if you're if you're just looking at deep sky 
they're, they're, they're more than sufficient. They produce very, very sharp views, very, very good um, little binocular. And for a finder scope, you've got a, um, the handle here. Uh, I've got a little um, bracket that mounts a little laser pointer. And what laser pointer is that? Um, I'm not too sure. You can get you can get several different types, but I, I think it's a it's one of the low power ones. Uh, and so you get your faint beam, and uh, it's ideal for locating objects very very high up because I've got a bit of a neck problem, yeah, and so using a, a finder scope can be a real pain. Literally uh, a pain in the neck. Literally a pain in the neck. So that is very very good. The only thing is the the batteries, they don't like the cold, and so. Um, Rechargeable batteries are better, um, and always, you know, I was saying about the little, my little grey box to take all the additional things out. Um, the last time I went out was using this, the battery died. Oh, so, it? oh heck, well, you know, so you can manage without it, but it's nicer to have it. Um, so the downside of having a pair of binoculars then is you need twice as many eyepieces. You do need twice as many eyepieces. Um, you do, um, but, but. It's twice as lovely yeah. looking through binoculars as it is through single eye because it's just so relaxing using both eyes. You're not squinting um, and you get that binocular summation effect where you see far more um, or apparently you see far more than you would do with a, with, a, um, with a single eye. So with those, I mean with those, the Veil Nebula is quite an easy target um, and I've got a couple of panoptics and they... These usually come with um, the APM ones. They come with the APM ultra flat eyepieces. These these are produced. They, the various um, uh, rebadging of these, and you can get them either cheaper or whatever. I know SV Bunny have produced started producing these ultra flat eyepieces, and I presume they're identical to all the other ones produced in the same factory in China. So um, you're a big fan of them, are you? Yes, the, the, um, I was going to get some, so I've got some 24mm panoptics to go with this, which are very good. But the 18mm, I was going to get 19mm panoptics to, to go with it. But those 18mm ultra flats, I think I don't need to because they're pretty good mm -hmm. as they are. And you're uh, luminous tape on the dust caps? Uh, that's the luminous tape, yes. Yeah. So when I do drop it, um, I haven't put any on these. When I do drop it, I can find it in a in a dark field somewhere. But they're... Uh, they're very good. Uh, that's very good. Yes. So, um, and also, I mean, they do. It's the same. And it's always difficult knowing whether you know, sort of, you're, you're buying something cheaper, whether it's going to be inferior. And no doubt, you get what you pay for. So, I've got some O3 filters here, which are the Astronomic O3 filters, and they're pretty good um, with with the telescope or with the binoculars. So they do work very well. Do you uh, have one one in each eyepiece, or do you do one one, both, one, one in each eyepiece? One yeah. in each. So I've got so again, like the eyepieces, you have to double up. So double up. I have heard some people just use one in one eyepiece uh, and use it that way. I've tried it, but it makes your eyes go a bit funny. That makes my <laughs> eyes go a bit funny. Um, but also, I've got um, like UHC filters. I've tried a number of UHC filters, and I really couldn't get on with them because they they cut out so much starlight. So you so it improves the visibility of your deep sky object, but you lose the background um, stars to a certain extent, and it just aesthetically the view isn't as pleasing. But this SV Bonnie again, sort of, um, they produce some UH filters, and I think they're. They're not very narrow band, they're quite wide, wide band filters. But what that does is it enhances the um, the the view, the contrast, uh, so it enhances the, the the deep sky object, but it doesn't kill the stars as well. So you you see the deep sky object set amongst the background stars, and for me it's just far more aesthetically pleasing than uh, the view without the stars there. So, so I've got a couple of those as well, and probably I use those more than I do the O3 do. filters, really? um, because it's with with the O3 filters and the say an astronomic UHC filter, you really know you're looking through a filter. With those, you kind of don't. You can forget there. You get there. the best of both worlds. Yeah, so yeah. it enhances the view, but it doesn't. You don't realise sometimes that you're actually looking through a filter. 
So yeah, nice, nice. So you scope. like your binos as well as the big scope? Very, very portable, which is lovely. Um, and the, the APM 80s, you said? Yeah, APM 80s, the, the non-ED versions. Um, 45 degree eyepieces, not as convenient as the 90 degree ones um, for looking at the Zenith, because you can get up to about so, and then you can see once, once you get up beyond that, you're having to contort your head and neck really to start looking in through the, through the eyepieces. But for anything, you know, sort of up to about 70 degrees, it's it's okay. Anything towards the zenith makes it a bit uncomfortable. But then all you have to do is wait a couple of hours, it's no longer at the zenith. Or look at it next week or something like yeah. that. So, yeah, so nice, nice uh, portable setup. So oh, that is that case. truly Good grab level. and go. And, you know, sort of for things like, uh, so I've got a couple of Delos eyepieces here. Um, Oh, very which, nice. Which are my favourite ones. These these are absolutely superb. And the with 80mm binoculars and 10mm Delos eyepieces, the um, the trapezium in M42 is absolutely glorious. I mean, I, I, I looked the other night, swapped the eyepieces over, looked, and I was absolutely taken aback as to how superb the view was. There's pinpoint sharp four stars in the middle of the nebulosity. Um, at a really nice image scale and as I say using two eyes it really is it's it's like looking out of rather than peering down the toilet roll it's like looking out of a picture window so Fantastic. so oh you know having used having got binoculars I don't think I'd go back um, to sort of like uh, using a telescope exclusively because you get so much more with binoculars this is an old um, just cheap dew shields because dew shields can be a you know, it can be quite expensive, certainly the smaller ones, but I made this out of an old yoga mat. So it's a cheap yoga mat, so you get an entire yoga mat, which is the length of a somebody who wants to do yoga, obviously, um, for about £10, and then cut it up into sections and just put Velcro on either side. And it's nice and flexible, and it forms a very nice dew shield. Um, flexible enough to go around the, the front end, but not really heavy at all. That's um, such a clever idea, isn't it? And it's just double. It's just adhesive Velcro, um, but I've I've added some super glue as well, just to sort of make Stop sure it peeling it's, away. Exactly, yeah, because the edges will peel away. And I say it's it's a cheap alternative to buying a dew shield. So uh, when do so, you go mat one roll of uh, Velcro? Yep, yeah, but just the yeah, just so one, you can't uh, do any Jaeger anymore, Barry. That's what you're saying. Your Jaeger's out the window now. Yeah. Well, I was I was finding that I was too inflexible to do yoga anyway. So, <laughs> but there we go. But it's that's that's quite that's quite good, and it works quite effective. Keeps the dew off the um, uh, off folds away to nothing, doesn't it? Binoculars, yeah, and it, it weighs absolutely nothing. So, that one, and they're only about S V Bonnie, however you pronounce. Oh, it. the yeah, the Chinese yeah. Bit, as we, Chinese, the yeah. Uh, but they're quite neat because they've got they've got U S B connectors, and they've got. Um, uh, Buttons, so you can. So if you haven't got a a dew controller, so you can turn the the temperature up and down. These have got sort of low, medium, and high. Oh, so, so you, you don't can, need to find your own controller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 quite neat. So you could. So I sort of like, I use them. Obviously, I've got two in there because I use them on a pair of binoculars. Um, but uh, I just plug them into to the little rechargeable power pack and um, set them on low, and that seems to work quite well. And what have you got wrapped around it? You've got like a sleeve? Uh, oh, it's just, yes, it's sleeves? just one of these Kevlar cable tidies. And it's just so you haven't got a bazillion cables strung everywhere. Just, well, keeps it tidy. Hence the name, I suppose. Yeah. So it's really quite neat. Because what I've, have, what I've had in the past with the, with the mount in the observatory, when it's been slewing around, one of the cables has got caught in the mechanism, I can't remember how, but that that mount, the EQ6, isn't particularly well designed for not snagging on cables. And I've right. had a couple of cables snag, and on one occasion it um, sheared the cable on a dew heater, oh. and there was a there was a sort of like a, a burning smell. Oh, where's that coming from? And it was the dew heat cable that was it, it sheared and it was starting to short out. So I do tend to put, if I have the dew heaters there, I put one of these Kevlar sheaths on it because that will protect it from gotcha. damage, hopefully. 
because everything just lives in this little plastic tub. Yeah, yeah. So, so if I am going out, I put everything in here. So it's not a case of when you get out there, you think I need to adjust the finder, but I haven't got the Allen key <laughs> that I need, or I haven't got the the, the, the power pack, or I've forgotten a, yeah. um, a, a dew heater or something like that, or I've forgotten the finder. It <laughs> all lives uh, in there. Yeah. Lovely. Well, so we're just cream. defrosting now. We've got a cup of tea. We've eaten the cake. You can eat more cake if you oh, like. Oh no, I'm going to pop. <laughs> so my thanks to Barry for his time in showing us around. It was a wonderful experience. I've learned loads as well just from having a look at his setup. Uh, as always, if you've got any questions or you've got any feedback, then put them in the comments below. And don't forget to check us a like and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next video.